Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year again. Happy 2020. Have to get used to saying it. 2020. Wow. This is what we call stalling. Get my, my stuff. Okay. Um, boy, 2019 went by in a blink, didn't it? Wow. I'm sure that some of you in this room are really glad that 2019 is behind you, right? Yeah, but this is a new year. It's a new year with new hope, new promises. This is our first service of 2020. We want to stop just for a quick second and just stop and thank God for what he did in Vero Bible Fellowship and continues to do, but what he did in 2019. Amen. Let's just give him a round of praise. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ray Garcia. I'm one of the pastors here, one of the staff pastors. Um, I'm so grateful that each and every one of you are here uh, with us today. Pastor Greg um, had a death in his family, and, so, and he was asked to preside over the mo memorial service. So uh, please continue to be in prayer over the family during this difficult time. So uh, we have a lot to cover today. So we're going to jump right in, and I'm going to start off with this amazing fact. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but did you know that the Bible is the number one selling book of all time, all right? It continues to be. Billions and billions, not millions, billions have been sold and distributed all around the world. That's the good news, right? The bad news is it's also one of the least read books. Less, they, they did a recent study, less than 10% of Americans read their own Bibles daily. So, guess what today's message is going to be on? Anybody? Ooh, you guys are smart. Ooh. <laughs> um, today, we are in part two of our foundation series called Created to Worship. Last week, Pastor Greg uh, covered worshiping God through prayer. Uh, this week, it's worshiping God, uh, worshiping God through his word, which, of course, is referring to the Bible, right? This is probably one of the most exciting topics for me. I absolutely love the word of God. Um, you know, usually here at VBF, we go through the book... Uh, we go through books of the Bible verse by verse, right? But today we're going to be talking about the significance of the Bible itself. So it's going to be more of a topical study, and we're going to be spanning Scripture throughout the entire Bible. Preaching about the Bible, um, for me, it can be a pretty daunting and challenging task. Um, why? Because I could stand up here the entire time for an entire sermon and give 50 phenomenal reasons why you should be reading and studying your Bible, and it could have little effect or change on you. You still may not read the Bible on your own. There's an old expression, I'm sure you've heard it before, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him, you can't make him drink. My hope today, and my prayer uh, is that the Lord would get me out of the way, and that the Holy Spirit will really do a supernatural work in each and every one of us, and that we would be over the top excited um, about the Bible, and even more so over the one who gave us the Bible, right? So before we go any further, let's do just that and pray. If you could just bow your heads, well, Lord, I just pray that we not, we're not just only students of the word, but that we would really grasp and treasure what it is that you have given us. It's the ultimate love letter from you to us. And Lord, if we're honest, I'm sure that there are folks here today that would rather do just about anything else other than read their Bibles. There are some here that may find it tedious and maybe even a drudgery. 
But Lord, I pray that you would do a supernatural work in each and every one of us so that maybe for the first time we would see the word in a whole new light. Lord, we know that apart from you, we're not going to be motivated to do this. So we ask you to change us today. Change our hearts. Give us a a burning passion for your word and through it an insatiable desire for you. Lord, help us to press in this morning with clear minds and open hearts and glean all the wonders you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to start off by telling you what we're not going to do today. We are not going to go through uh, the doctrine of the Bible. We could literally spend weeks upon weeks um, over a period of sermons or several sermons just covering the doctrine of the Bible. Now, what I mean by the doctrine of the Bible is the Bible's origin, its history, how it was preserved, its divine nature, its infallibility, its inerrancy, its reliability. We're not going to be covering that today. Um, Today I want to really just spend this time to encourage you, uh, to implore you to really discover the joy that comes from being immersed in God's Word. So that you would not be that proverbial horse that we talked about that is led to water and won't drink, even to your own detriment, right? I want to explore with you the Bible as it relates to your identity in Christ. And as worshipers of God, I'm sure you've picked up on the theme already just through our worship today. Um, This is what we were created to be. Now this, uh, approaching the Bible through our identity in Christ, maybe a different, different perspective than, you, than you're used to today, um, maybe than you've considered before. So, But even though we're not going to be going through the doctrine of the Bible, um, I just want to touch on one main doctrinal point to kind of serve as a foundation. This is going to be our launching point. We'll start with the premise, right, the belief accepted by most born-again evangelical Christians, and that is that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Amen? Okay. Second Peter 1.21 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What this verse means is that Scripture didn't come up. It didn't... It didn't come up from the creative work of the prophet's own invention, right, or interpretation. God inspired the writers. Therefore, the importance of that is the message is authentic and it's reliable, right? Now, God used, he, they, they weren't mindless robots. He used their talents. He used their education. He used their cultural background, even their personalities of each writer. God cooperated with the writers in such a way to ensure that his message was going to be communicated faithfully. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16, and we're going to be referring to this scripture quite a bit throughout this message because it's just packed. It's so rich. All scripture is breathed out by God. So it's really important that we understand that God himself is the source of the Bible, even though he gave it to us through people, right? Now, if you guys care to dig into, you know, I talked about the doctrine of the Bible. If you care to dig into those things that I mentioned, um, I have some great resources that I would love to share with you. Please feel free to call me or email me, and I can get those to you. Uh, Just some phenomenal tools that can really help you understand and appreciate the doctrine of the Bible. Okay, so now that we have that premise laid down, we're going to move on. This This is so important, guys, reading the Bible. And it's a struggle for, for many of us, right? Reading the Bible is not just something that we do as Christians. When we become Christians, we we start thinking like, well, we've got our list. I've got to do this. 
I've got to do this. And this is just one of the things that I have to do as a Christian is read my Bible. It's not just something that we do. Reading the Bible is about who we are in Christ. It's about our identity. Have you ever thought about that? If you only read the Bible as something you're supposed to do, you're going to miss out on the most important aspect of reading the Bible. You will actually miss out on the, on the very essence of what God desires for you. That essence can be described in one word. Relationship. See, the world views Christianity as just, what, another religion, right? But to those who are truly in Christ Jesus, it's not about a religion. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's about a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. At least that's what we should aspire and desire to have with God. Now, today, I'm going to give you guys a a bunch of wonderful, scripturally-based reasons why you should read and study your Bible. But here's the big one. Here's the big one. This is ultimately what it's all about, folks. It's about our relationship with God and our relationship to God. There's a distinction there. What is our relationship to God as born-again Christians? Let's hold, let's hold that thought for now. We're going to get back to it, and we're going to answer that soon. But I'm going to read a passage of Scripture to you that beautifully captures why we pray, why we pour through the pages of this Bible and pretty much motivates everything we do as believers. Now, today's reading that you heard read already was Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. You don't need to turn there. As a matter of fact, I I encourage you to just listen. It was read in the English Standard Version, version, which is our go-to version here at the Vero Bible Fellowship. I'm going to reread it to you in the New Living Translation, which is the translation that we give out to uh, new believers when they surrender their lives to Christ. Um, you may, as you hear this scripture, you may say, oh, Ray, you, you know, you've read this before. You've shared this with us before. That's okay. Let me tell you, this, this passage of scripture is so important that we need to be reminded that this is who we're about. This is what we're about. All of us need to be reminded. I know I do. I need to be reminded of this every day. So, and if you want, as I'm reading this, if you want, even close your eyes. I encourage you to close your eyes. And to, don't just focus on the words, but really focus on the heart of the psalmist. See if you can sense and you can feel his heart. Psalm 63. O God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake, thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. Guys, we could go home right now. We've had church. That's what it's all about. It's about loving God. Not just just loving God, but loving God more than life itself. 
Let that, let that sink in for a few seconds. It's about worshiping him with our whole being. That's what that psalm really captured. We worship God as we earnestly search for him, as our soul thirsts for him. It's an act of worship. That's why we read our Bibles. This should be our heart's desire. Why? Because this is what we were created for. We were created to worship him. And we can worship him every single time we open this Bible. Have you ever thought of that, that this is a way to worship God just by opening the page of this Bible and starting to pour through those? Folks, please, please, please don't miss this. There, this is where we need to be in our relationship with Christ. Now, why would we ever like, want this kind of intensity, this kind of intensity with God? Why? Because he's our loving father. Amen? We're family. Sometimes we forget that. We're family with God. Think about this. The creator of all the heavens and the earth has adopted you and I as his own, and he loves you beyond your imagination. We read the Bible because of who we are. And who are we? We are his children, right? His masterpiece, his workmanship. I've heard people say this. You'll hear this all the time. They'll say, Oh, we are, we are all God's children. God created everyone. Therefore, everyone is his child. Now, that sounds really beautiful, doesn't it? We're all God's children. But does scripture really say that everyone is a child of God? And that, that all, everyone will someday be with him in heaven? Now, listen to this. This was right. And we didn't plan this. I know Brenton read uh, a portion of this or read this. We did not plan it at all, so it was definitely a God thing. But listen to John chapter 1, verse 9 through 13. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the, into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. Now, don't miss this. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Wow. This is one incredibly, not just powerful, but revealing scripture. All right? Yeah, it's true. It's absolutely true that every single human being on earth is God's creation, right? We accept that. But only those who receive Christ and believe in his name become what? Children of God. That's who you are. That's who you are if you've given your life to Christ. You are a child of God. Celebrate that. Remember that. That's the main reason. That's the main reason to dig into this book. To deepen our under, not just our understanding, but our love for this incredibly amazing, loving, forgiving, gracious, merciful God. He's our Father. We worship our Abba Father by seeking Him and spending time with Him through His Word. When you pick up this book and you delve in and you seek his face, that's a natural outpouring. It's an expression of our relationship with him, right? We talked about that, but also to him as his children. It's wanting to know him, to grow in him, to worship him and love him back with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. Folks, again, please don't miss this. 
The Bible is a means to an end. I'm going to say that again. The Bible is a means to an end. We don't worship the Bible, right? The Bible points us to the one to worship and love. Amen? Never lose sight of why we read the Bible in the first place. It's so important. Don't get so caught up in the study of the word, analyzing every portion that you simply forget to enjoy God's presence through his word. If you're more enamored with the word of God than God himself, you're missing the point. Here's an example. I'm going to give you an example. A botanist. A botanist is someone devoted to the science of plants. Botany, botany is the branch of biology that deals with plant life. There, hey, there's two ways that we can approach a flower, right? We can approach the flower scientifically. We can pull it at the root. We can start dissecting it. We can put it under the microscope, look at its striations, its genome, all that stuff. Or... You come upon the flower and you can stop and you can appreciate its beauty, its color, its fragrance. Now, I just mentioned two different ways that you can approach. Both of them are good. I'm not saying you should do this one instead of that one. Both of them are good. It's absolutely necessary to study the Bible, right? It's important to memorize scripture, but never lose sight that it's about who? It's about God. It's about him. Folks, you can have entire chapters of the Bible memorized. You could be the master of exegesis and hermeneutics and be a walking Bible commentary and still wind up spending an eternity separated by God. Pretty scary thought, huh? It's about relationship. You can know all about God and still not know him, right? And hopefully, and my prayer is for those of you who are already believers in this room, for those of you who already know him and have a relationship with him, that you will be drawn even deeper into that relationship through the reading of his word. And those of you who are not yet saved will enter into that relationship with him as God reveals his plan and his desire for you. Once we really grasp the purpose and the main purpose of this book, which is knowing God and coming into relationship with your heavenly father, it can totally, radically change your approach to the Bible. That's my hope and my prayer for you this upcoming year, that you would look at this totally different. Now, folks, if you don't hear or remember anything else I say from this point on, don't, please don't miss that one point, which, by the way, is not permission for you to stop paying attention, all right? All right, so as we continue, I'm going to be giving you some main points. They'll be appearing on the screen. Um, I'm going to be moving along at a pretty fast clip, so don't feel like you have to write all these down. They will be made available to you later on in the newsletter and things like that. So if you just want to listen to them, um, that's fine, but we're going to be moving right along. Uh, we're going to be starting with this first point, and that is God wants you to know him. Look at James 4, 8. Draw near to God, and what? And he will draw near to you. It's the Lord's desire for us to know him. It's his desire for, he wants that relationship. He wants us to know him. Listen to this verse. I love this passage of scripture. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24 says, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts 
boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Pretty powerful, huh? The next point. The Bible is our instruction manual. It's our blueprint. It takes the guesswork out of our lives, out of our Christian lives. Can you imagine if we decided in this room and said, we're, we're going we're gonna to get some people together and we're going to build a mall or a skyscraper or some kind of building complex, you name it, without any blueprints. No manual, no blueprints. It, it can't be done. Or if it is done, it's going to be a disaster. I can tell you right now, it is not going to be anything that's going to be structurally sound. We're going to make a mess out of it. Look, even something as simple as putting together, for, you just picture some of the fathers and moms this past Christmas trying to put toys together for their kids. What a disaster that can be when we don't have instructions. Or perhaps a, uh, an elaborate playground set in the backyard uh, what that could look like when you don't have some kind of a manual or instructions, right? The Bible, this is the Christian's manual, right? For living, it's God-produced manual to show us his way, right? Look at 2 Timothy again, 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. In other words, it makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. It makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. Not just that, but it straightens us out, and it teaches us what to do that's right. I'm sure most of you here remember that old song by Frank Sinatra. What is, what is one of his most famous songs? Not, not New York, New York. What is it? I did it my way. Think about that song. That song could very well be the theme song of the entire world apart from Christ. Okay? It's all about, hey, I'm doing it my way. But this... When we pour into this, we're seeking his way, okay? The Bible is a map to guide us. Psalm 119, 19 says, I am a stranger or a traveler or a sojourner on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. The psalmist is saying in here that he's a stranger on earth, and so he needs guidance, you think about it, almost any long trip is going to require some kind of a map or guide. Uh, and the same thing applies to us. As we travel through life, the Bible should be our road map. Think of it as our divine GPS, right? It's pointing out safe routes, not just safe routes, obstacles to avoid as we go towards our final destination. Christians are travelers. We're pilgrims, folks. This is not our final destination, right? We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We need to study God's map in order to learn the way as we navigate. If we ignore the map, we will wander aimlessly, I assure you, through life, and we'll risk missing our real destination and our full potential. The Bible is a light for our life. Psalm, one, Psalm 119, 105, just like the song that we sang today. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Now, back in the day, I was an avid backpacker. I would backpack 10, 15 miles into the woods with you know, 40, 50 pounds on my back and do overnight camping and things like that. But let me tell you, one of the scariest things and very difficult things to do is walking in the forest, walking through the woods once it's starting to get dark. It can be very, very treacherous. Um, aside from 
not being able to see the critters that are walking through there, like bears and lions and tigers and bears, oh my. But um, you have to worry about roots, just something as simple as roots and holes that you might fall in that are covered over by leaves. Guys, that's exactly what it's like in our lives. We're walking through a dark forest of challenges, right? Evil all around us. But the Bible can be our light to show us the way ahead. Why? So we don't stumble as we walk. It reveals these entangling roots of, of false doctrine, false philosophies. Study the Bible. Study this word so you're able to see your way clear enough to stay on the right path. The Bible gives us wisdom. Psalm 119.99 says, I have more insight or understanding than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. God's word makes us wise, wiser than our enemies, even wiser than some teachers who choose to ignore this, right? True wisdom goes beyond amassing knowledge. It's applying knowledge in a life-changing way. Hey, there are a lot of intelligent or experienced people that are not necessarily wise. I'm sure you've met them. The Bible is our key to success. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it once in a while. No, you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Don't miss this. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now we're talking about God's definition of success here, folks, not, not man's estimation. It's based on God's economy. We're not talking... Um, about a prosperity gospel here. The Bible is basic equipment. Think about military. Think about law enforcement. You really can't function if, if these folks were not, they wouldn't even be able to function if they were not at least given some basic equipment. Can you imagine a police officer uh, going to execute a search warrant or make a felony arrest with no firearm, no body armor, no handcuffs, no radio, it's impossible. You can't do it. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16, 17 again. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now here's the why. Why? So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Moving right along. The Bible reveals the living God to us. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is dead. Buddha, dead. Confucius, dead. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, dead. Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, is dead. The list goes on and on. Jesus Christ, the author and founder of our faith, is alive. Amen? Amen. Not just alive in heaven, but alive in each and every heart of the believer. Amen? He's alive in us. Listen to these verses. Luke 24 Verses 1 through 7. And this is about the women from Galilee who had uh, gone to, who had been at the cross when Jesus was uh, crucified, then went to Jesus' tomb after he was crucified. And when they went there seeking to find Jesus' body, what did they encounter? Two angels. And this is what they said Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but has risen. 2 Corinthians 13.4 says, For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. The Bible documents, 
I don't know if you realize this number when I give it to you, but the Bible documents that Jesus appeared to hundreds of people after his death over a 40-day period. We have Jesus' own personal testimony that he was raised from the dead. Revelation 1.18 says, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm a, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. The Bible reveals that we serve a living God, one who reigns in the hearts of Christians and is the head of his church. The Bible reveals God's plan for our redemption, the gospel or the good news. There is, we don't have enough time to go through. There is scripture upon scripture upon scripture that clearly shows us the way to salvation. There's not one person, no one is going to have an excuse when they close their eyes this side of heaven, right? The Bible helps us point others as well to Jesus, the only way of salvation. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 10, 9 through 13, but we're going to do verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here's the next point. The Bible is totally, totally relevant for us today. There are a lot of people who say, what does this book written thousands and thousands of years ago have, well, how could this have any relevance in my life? When you read this, you're going to see. When you read this, the Bible doesn't just expose the problem with our world. It provides the only logical, just, and proven way to fix it. The Bible has the solution to man's every single problem, social, physical, economic, emotional, political, and most of all, spiritual. I want you to think about this. What are, what are some of life's toughest questions, right? Why am I here? Has anybody ever asked that before? Why am I here? I don't mean here at Bureau Bible Fellowship. Where did I come from? Why is there suffering? That's a big one, right? Do I have a soul? Why do I feel such guilt over my evil actions? What happens after death? A lot of people fear death. They don't know what happens after death. Is there any hope in my situation? Is there anything that I can put my trust in? Look, folks, if you have a problem with anger, it's in here. It's addressed in here. You have a problem with lust, pride, issues with jealousy, you want to learn more about parenthood, issues with favoritism, it's in here. Depression, low self-esteem, it's all in the word of God. The Lord is willing and he's able to minister to you to help you with all these things that I just mentioned. But you have to be, will you have to be willing to, to pick this up and seek him. Amen? The Bible is transforming. The word of God is living. It's life-changing and it's dynamic as it works in us. Hebrews 4.12, just A, says, For the word of God is full of living power. Listen to this. Psalms 19, verse 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them 
is your servant warned? Which that last verse segues us into our next point. The Bible warns and protects us. Psalm 19, 11a says, which we just read, moreover by them your servant is warned. It helps us to not be led astray from that what? From that simple and pure devotion to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 3 and 4. The Bible is absolutely essential to our spiritual growth. If you are not in the word, you're actually stunting your own growth. You're actually stunting your own growth. I'm going to just give you, we're going to flash these up on the screen, these two references, just for uh, lack of time. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Hebrews 5.11-14. through 14. The Bible helps us also fight sin and temptation. And I'm going to give you some great verses. And I hope, I hope that when you leave here, at least at some point through the week, you go back and go through these verses. I really encourage you to do that. Read them, you know, look them up for yourself. Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11. Psalm 119, 11. Psalm 37, 31. And Ephesians 6, 17. I'm going to give you guys, and we're starting to wind down here. I'm going to give you guys a couple of great quotes. A dusty Bible will lead to a dirty life. Think about that. Howard Hendricks wrote, The Bible keeps you from sin, and sin keeps you from the Bible. Hmm. Now, guys, if I had three hours to preach, I could give you many, many more biblical reasons why you should be in the Word. But it boils down to the truth that we were created to worship God. And what a better way to do that, to worship God, than to deepen our relationship with him through his word. What a better way to start off 2020, right? With a renewed and refreshed commitment to pursue our awesome Jesus through the word of God. Amen? Look, there's a, I'm going to give you a quick, couple of quick tools there are so many useful practical, practical tools to invigorate your time in the Word. There's a, first of all, there's a ton of Bible reading plans that you can get online for free. You can just pull them up and start doing a plan. I've used one. It's called the One Year Bible. I highly recommend that. It gives you a chunk of the Old Testament, a good slice of the New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, and the following day picks up exactly where it left off. That way you're not trying to go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, which is very, very difficult to do. Um, this right here also recommend this. It's called Living by the Book by Howard and Williams Hendrick. Definitely write this down, Living by the Book. And it will help you get the most out of your Bible study and your reading. It introduces you to the inductive Bible study method. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever had a pastor give you an assignment from the pulpit? Give you some homework? Well, if you haven't, this is a first for you. Because I'm going to give you an assignment. Everybody write this down, right? I want everyone in here, and I'm going to ask you next week. I want everyone in here to read Psalm 119. Okay, it's the long, it is a long chapter, it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. But I want you to read this next week, and for you overachievers, I want you to memorize it. <laughs> All right, ask the Lord to give you the same passion as you're reading that. Make that your prayer. So, oh, I'm, I'm not there, I'm reading this. Oh, I'm not quite, but man, just pray that back to God. That that would be your heart. Because you're going to notice he loves God's word, but he loves God even more, right? I want to close with this inspirational writing. Now hone in. I know that the temptation is, is to start thinking about barbecue and stuff and where am I going to eat. But I want you, but I'm bring you guys back in. Settle in. I want you to listen to this inspirational writing 
that really captures the value of the Bible. This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored, heaven open, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. Follow its precepts, and it will lead you to Calvary, to the empty tomb, to a resurrected life in Christ. Yes, to glory itself for eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time together. Just learning about your word through your word. Lord, as we enter into this new year, Lord, I just, I just ask you, I beseech you that you will bless each and every person here with the greatest gift that we could ever have, and that is a deeper relationship with you. Oh, God, break through any barriers that we may have created and, and help us, help us, oh, God, to experience you in ways that we never have before. Lord, as we leave this place, may this be the year that we become Psalm 63 people, that we would love you more than life itself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.